Trust, uh, if you're not familiar, I am a stewardship project manager. We, uh, we serve 15 different communities along the western edge of Penobscot Bay. So uh, most people are familiar with our Beach Hill Preserve down in Rockport. And then our furthest north preserve is uh, Penobscot Shore, which is uh, all the way up just north of actually the Bucksport Bridge if you were headed to Acadia. So uh, we go inland as far as Knox. And uh, so, yeah, we, we serve 15 different towns and, uh, and those communities along Western Penobscot Bay. Um, we are um, the local land trust. We, we were established in 1986. We kind of formed around the Beach Hill Preserve and have grown uh, since then. And uh, I'm, I'm super excited, like Julie, to, uh, to have Dave here. Dave is actually a old college friend of mine. Uh, we both attended Unity College at the same time and uh, played hockey together. So it's nice to kind of reconnect and, uh, and, and, and reach out to old friends when, when you need to. So uh, Dave, um, just real quick, uh, let me get uh, Dave's intro up here. Uh, Dave's, Dave has a, a bachelor's of science in wild, wildlife biology and management and has a master's in conservation biology. Uh, he's been a wildlife research uh, uh, biologist with um, Biodiversity Research Institute, which is based here in Maine, um, but they do do work all over the world. Um, Dave's worked for uh, BRI since the Institute's inception in 1998. Uh, he is the director of the MAMMAL program, and he's actively involved with various field studies focusing on wildlife conservation and management and health assessment of aquatic ecosystems through contaminant screening. Uh, he's researching bats as an indicator species for mercury exposure. And he's been studying my, mitosis bats. I'm sorry if I butchered that, Dave, uh, in, a, in Acadian National Park for over 10 years to help the park manage with management decisions concerning bats. He also conducts inventories of small and large mammals mammals for various state agencies and the Department of Defense and other federal agencies. So without, uh, without further ado, uh, welcome Dave Yates. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lunch House Library, for putting this on. Uh, it's always great to get the word out about um, bats, something I love. Um, so uh, I'll start out with um, I like to start out with this this slide and hopefully everybody can see there's a, uh, a house and then uh, some pictures of a bat uh, some bats roosting uh, in, in that house um, it's kind of an interesting story and I think there are colleagues on here that might have worked with me on this project um, this is uh, this is a house, uh, it was an abandoned house uh, in Virginia. And uh, we were looking at mercury contamination uh, in a river. And, um, you know, the house was of interest because it had over 5,000 bats in it, um, mostly little brown bats. And, you know, for somebody like me, that's a, that's a cool place to go hang out. Uh, I understand a lot of people don't think that, but, uh, uh, but, Kind of the, the interesting thing about this house, uh, and, and I just like to tell this little story, is, is you know, the bats, the bats were there, um, but there are many other animals there. Uh, you know, there, it was an ecosystem in itself. There were snakes, raccoons, um, you know, owls and hawks that lived outside, uh, you know, all, all kind of pivoting around the bats that were there. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, those are predators for bats. Um, but you know, the bats were in there to have their babies and to raise them and, and, you know, they'll go out in the world and hopefully make more bat babies. Um, I'll finish the story later. Um, but I, I, I think it is, uh, it was a cool kind of place where, um, you know, th that we would we'd be able to go and be able to do our research that we needed to do because there were so many bats. Uh, and it, it was, like I said, an ecosystem in itself. I'll, I'll leave that there for now. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Go on to my next slide.
Okay. So let's just get into some basics right off the bat. Uh, you know, a lot of people will ask questions, uh, are bats birds? Uh, are they featherless birds? No, they're not. Um, you know, they're the only mammals that can actually truly fly. Now we have gliders like squirrels and monkeys and um, uh, some other animal, mammals that uh, can perform that, but they're not true flight. And uh, there's kind of a battle going on between fossils of, you know, they find a bird fossil that was three million years old and then they find a bat fossil that's three and a half million years old. And, uh, so there's, there's, there's debate out there right now, um, but birds are maybe a little bit ahead of maybe taking to the air before mammals. Um, but we might find out later that, that that was not the case. But uh, how do we know they're mammals? Um, what are characteristics of mammals, right? And uh, being warm-blooded, being able to regulate your body temperature is, is one thing that we do in criteria for mammals. So we all nurse our young. Right, we all uh, mammary glands, and we nurse our young. Whether we're human, bats, mice, whales, um, and bats have fur, and that's another criteria to be a mammal. Um, all the mammals pretty much have fur. Uh, you know, even uh, whales and um, some of the some of the mammals that you would think that aren't, uh, uh, you know. Uh, like that, but anyway, uh, so where in, where in the world will we find bats? Um, so, they're on every continent except Antarctica, and why would you think that maybe they're not in Antarctica? Well, one of bats major food sources is either bugs or nectar or mm, things like that. So, really Antarctica doesn't afford a place for a bat to forage or live. Um, maybe that'll change in a hundred years. or. <laughs> uh, so really, um, bats can be found all over the world, but really in the area of the equator, um, whoops, went too far, sorry about that. Um, the tropics, we call it. Um, in the tropics, we could find the biggest diversity of bats uh, in the world. And uh, it, there's over 1,400 species of known bats that we, that we know about right now and and we find you know scientists find new species pretty much every year um you could imagine bats aren't the easiest things to find because they're in a world that you know that is quite foreign to us um out at night we don't really see as well and and um and you know they're flying, so they're they're in uh, a space that you know is hard for us to uh, really get into, and then obviously uh, see them in the middle of the night flying around in the air can be difficult. So, um, just quick bat wings. Um, again, they're mammals like us, and they have the thumb. You can see that right there, and and they use that thumb to climb. Uh, it's almost like a little grappling hook is the best way to describe it. Um, some some bats that's a very big appendage, and some bats that's small. But it's a nice way that they climb up walls, uh, trees, caves, any any type of surfaces. And and then you can see the um, the humerus bone, and and then the forearm, and then the fingers. And so it's just like our anatomy. Um, the bats are very similar, uh, and you know with having these wings and they've evolved over time that you know that, that you could just be able to fly and get up into you know treetops and places that maybe weren't being utilized by other mammals um, all right some more bat biology uh our bats really blind i get a lot of that um they are not uh Bats can see perfectly well during the night and the day. Um, and at night, they can see far better than we can. Um, so, you know, all those myths you hear about bats not being able to see, or blind as a bat, you know, those are just kind of old tales. Um, and as we learn more with uh, 
the stuff we, we understand. And, and uh, so, you know, Batsy really well. And um, also to help them at night, they use something called echolocation. And basically what they do is they send sound out, whether it could be through their nose or an appendage in their nose, uh, or through their mouth. And um, they send out this really high-pitched ultrasound that will go out to the environment and it returns. And, and when it returns, uh, it tells them everything that's around them. Uh, and especially uh, it helps them echolocate uh, their prey. And, and you can see that in this slide here. So the, the uh, sound pulse bounces out, uh, sorry, comes out of the, the bat and uh, bounces off the moth and is sent back to the bat and and with that the bat can tell the size the shape um how fast that object is moving uh which direction it's moving in uh it, it really is quite amazing um you know all the information they can get out of it and uh it's pretty much everything they need to decide okay is this a target or is this something that i don't normally eat And so, like I said here, here's a, here's a bat, it's the leaf nose bat. And um, you can see that kind of, that, that um, skin flap between its eyes. And that's really what it is. And, and you could actually lift that flap up and it's a hollow cavity underneath. And, and, and the cool thing about these bats is as they're flying through the rainforest um, and they catch a bug, they could still echolocate um, as they're eating. Uh, whereas if you echolocate out of your mouth, um, it makes it difficult, obviously, to eat and echolocate at the same time. So these guys have figured out a way to eat and, you know, still walk <laughs> or still fly for these guys. So, it, it, you know, it's, I guess it's the analogy of uh, chewing gum and walking. Um, the other cool thing about uh, echolocation is, is, is the prey uh, have evolved as well. And they'll detect the ultrasonic sounds from the bats. And whether it's a moth or a lizard, um, they'll avoid areas, you know, where there's a lot of echolocation calls. So um, on, a, on a, um, a moth has a really cool thing. It's almost like a lateral line on a fish. And when the, um, the moth gets hit on one side of its body with echolocation uh, pulses from the bat or ultrasonic pulses from the bat, the wing on the opposite side will automatically stop and it does this like barrel roll and it's a kind of avoidance to get away from the bat. Um, so it's, you know, evolutionary warfare going on up there every night uh it's kind of cool to think about that you know how you avoid and how predators find food and how prey is good at avoiding becoming becoming food um so it's the species species bat um so bats are very diverse like i said there's there's you know 1400 species of known bats in the world um and they could be very small, um, which is a bumblebee bat, which weighs about as much as a penny, or actually a little bit less than a penny. Um, and, you know, to give you a size comparison, it's about the size of maybe your thumbnail on an average man's uh, hand. Uh, that's how small this bat is. Uh, and then you could go to the flying fox. Uh, the giant golden crown flying fox, which has a six foot wingspan and uh, is you know, pretty big. <laughs> um, so we, we kind of break these bats up into mega bats and micro bats. Um, and here you can see this is the bumblebee bat here. Um, the micro bats are small uh, and they'll eat uh, insects, um, fish, lizards, birds, nectar, 
um, they all, most of them can echolocate and they're found most, you know, in most places around the web. Actually, all places that you find bats, you'll, you'll find micro bats. Now the mega bats are a little bit different. Uh, they're known as the flying foxes. And a lot of times in movies when um, they're depicting, um, you know, a vampire bat or something like that, they show something like this. And then, you know, the bat biologist in the room knows that, well, that's actually a fruit bat. <laughs> uh, and, you know, doesn't want your blood, doesn't want any insects or anything like that. And, uh, you know, these guys um, can be quite large or to, um, you know, they could be actually quite small. They could be as small as some of the micro bats. Um, and they are found usually in the tropical regions of the world. Uh, and they're important, uh, they're really important for uh, pollination and seed dispersal around rainforests. Um, and it's, uh, you know, basically think of them as a replanting uh, forest. Now, vampire bats, everybody always wants to know about vampire bats. Um, I've caught vampire bats in Central America. Uh, they're not very big. Um, they're, uh, well, it's hard to give people size comparison, but maybe the size of somebody's fist uh, for a body. Um, you know, they're, they're about the size of our big brown bats. Um, and, you know, one question we get uh, is, uh, you know, the vampire bat is the only bat that will, uh, that will eat blood. Um, and I say eat blood um, because a lot of people think that, you know, vampire bats will suck your blood, and that's not what they do. Um, really kind of what they do is, uh, you know, there's a sleeping prey or something like that, and they sneak up on them. They use those really sharp front incisor their teeth to kind of make a small incision, and then they sit there and lap up the blood. Um, and a uh, kind of cool thing about their saliva is, they have anticoagulants um, that just kind of let the blood keep flowing uh, and they'll get their fill and they'll move on. Um, there have been some cool studies looking at like um, chickens that have been repeatedly predated by vampire bats. And what they find is that after about two to three weeks, the chickens develop antibodies that will counteract the saliva in the bats. Um, it, the, the, the anticoagulants in the bat's saliva, and they will clot the blood. So at that point, you know, the bat maybe moves on and, and um, moves to a different, different animal or a different prey. Uh, again, what interesting. Uh, bat behavior, um, bats, you know, they're nocturnal. You know that, they hunt uh, and eat at night and they sleep during the day. Now, occasionally you'll see a bat falling out during the day. That doesn't mean that that bat is sick or there's something wrong. Um, it could have been disturbed uh, out of its roost um, by a human or by um, uh, a predator. So sometimes we will see bats fly during the day. And how do bats sleep? Well, they hang by their feet. Usually, and, and whether it's from a, a, a cave ceiling like these guys are, or a, a tree or whatever, but the really good, their feet are like little Velcro um, claws, and uh, they're very good at hanging. And typically, most bats uh, are very social and usually like to sleep together in large groups. And um, you know, one reason for that would be predator avoidance, things like that, and uh, unborn. White bats here in the rainforest, they'll, um, they'll find a big leaf in the rainforest, chew the mid vein of the leaf, and it folds over on itself. So it's kind of like bent like that, and it makes a little teepee, and they'll go up in the teepee, and then they'll, they'll roost in there for maybe a week or two, and, and then they'll move on to another one um, down the road. But um, so some of the bats, you know, can, can roost in mines, they roost in. Um, uh, cobwebs, they, they roost in uh, houses, trees, um, 
there's a lot of different areas where bats will roost. Um, basically, as long as they're out of sight and kind of uh, tucked away and away from predators, it's probably a good spot for them. And, and if they're a mom bat, uh, what they're really looking for probably is a warm area to have their babies in. Uh, and that's why they really like people's barns and attics and things like that. So bat caves, um, you know, there, there are bat caves all around the world um, with, you know, some have millions of bats, some have hundreds of bats. We are pretty lucky uh, to probably have one of the largest concentrations of mammals in the world here in the United States, right in Texas, uh, in a little place uh, down in uh, uh between Austin and San Antonio, Bracken Cave. And uh, there's probably any, you know, I've heard estimates anywhere from 15 to 30 million free tail bats. And um, you can imagine that's, that's an army of bats. And, and it, it takes about um, two to three hours or more for all the bats in the cave to get out of the cave and go fly off and, and feed for the night. These bats eat tons and tons of insects uh, that could be potential crop pests or things like that. And uh, not only does Texas have uh, one of the biggest bat caves, but they also have one of the biggest bat bridges. Uh, so, you know, bats are very adaptable and, and they've learned to, you know, really kind of adapt to urban life and living in cities. Uh, the Congress Avenue Bridge in Austin has about a million free tail bats that you could go from probably about the uh, April till maybe October um, and, and see these guys right in downtown Austin. And they fly out, they fly out down the river and uh, it is a pretty cool sight. Um, you'll see, you know, large groups of mammals like this being able to congregate and you know with that comes the peregrine falcons and all the you know all the other stuff that are gonna want to eat the bats um so we'll talk about bat babies real quick um after hibernation the females female bats at least in north america i should say for hibernation um the female bats will uh, migrate to their areas where they're going to have their babies. Uh, and they start having babies. And, and the, the big thing about the babies is they're born defenseless and blind and with no fur. What you're looking at right there is probably, um, they're probably about two weeks old, roughly. Those are red bats. Um, and and the and kind of the cool thing about those guys is the moms will carry um, those bats to from a you know from a tree to a tree um if you know the babies are in trouble or something like that or if she just wants to move roost so uh most of our bats in north america usually only have one baby um but there are a handful that will have twins or triplets um and usually uh, it takes about a month to a month and a half to reach fallency, uh, meaning that the, the pups can fly. Uh, and that's an important, uh, obviously, milestone. Now, this is a, a picture of a little brown bat, which was a very common bat in North America. Uh, it would be the one with the tiny little baby right next to it. Um, and that baby was, that, that's a fresh baby. That baby is an hour old. Um, and that baby, that bat had that baby in that bag. Um, we were, you could see that we were doing some work on the mom and, and she had the baby and the baby and the mom were put back in the roost. Uh, and, you know, to my knowledge, they, they were okay. They, they, you know, she'll, the baby will cling to the mother and the mother just climbs back up into the roost. And, and then you could see the picture on the, uh, the other side where you have one mom bat and then there's a bunch of babies. And um, so sometimes bats will take care of, uh, you know, other babies as well. Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily their own. And where we see this the most, believe it or not, is actually in vampire bats. Uh, 
vampire bats are very altruistic and uh, altruism is not something you always see particularly in nature uh, we talk about it quite a bit but uh, true altruism where you know another animal of the same species will take care of a non-related um, individual um, because it could possibly better the group as a whole uh, is you know something that we don't always see but we do see in vampire bats so let's talk a little bit about this um, predators of bats and and what they include so you know like i said when you go to those kind of areas where there are a lot of bats congregating you'll see owls falcons raccoons house cats snakes um all around the, you know a bat is a great meal um and and uh but you know really the biggest threat is uh humans um you know whether it's intentional or non-intentional um bats over the years have really taken it hard um and you know that goes back to some of the myths and mythology kind of uh, placed on bats and our lack of knowledge really for some of these wildlife animals that um, maybe have less understanding. I always get questions about bats and rabies and, and, and really, um, so we're looking at like less than a half a percent of bats um, carry rabies that we know of in the United States. Fewer than 40 people have died um, from bats and rabies. It does happen, uh, it's very rare. The one thing um, about being a bat biologist is uh, that's definitely something that we take a lot of care in. That we have um, we we have our vaccines where we get vaccinated uh, against rabies, and we check our our blood usually at least once a year um, to make sure that we have the antibodies necessary to be able to handle bats, and 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 then we also use precautions when we're handling bats. Um, not to get bit uh, is, is, is key as well. So, um, you know, there's precautions there uh, on both ends, but. Um, Dave, Dave, can I ask you a quick question about that? Sure. How, how does the percentage of, you know, rabies in bats compare with, you know, like mice or squirrels or, or other animals um, that, you know, rabies are usually associated with? Far, um, so rabies would be far more prevalent in um, foxes or raccoons or really kind of any of any other animal really. Um, again, bats have kind of taken on, um, uh, you know, probably the rabies uh, one on the hardest, um, you know, for whatever reason, I, I, I don't know why that is, um, but really, uh, yeah, so prevalence in, in other mammals is far higher uh, than bats uh, in general. And I, I don't know uh, a percentage for some of those animals, but you, you have to remember too that, you know, all that is still pretty low when you consider the population. You know, the, um, I, I, I don't want to throw out numbers because then I can get trouble. <laughs> no problem. Thanks so much for answering that. Yep. Um, so bats in the Northeast. And really, it's uh, maybe New England uh, that we'll talk about. Obviously, we live here in Maine. Uh, when I see New England or, or, or the Northeast as nine species of bats, um, Maine would be lacking one of those species, and that would be the Indiana bat. Um, so here's, you know, here's a little brown bat. And uh, this was one of our most common bats. There was estimated a uh, population of 20 to 30 million across the United States. Um, you can see that there's a little transmitter on the back of that bat. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but uh, this bat is a, a cave bat, a myotis bat. Uh, bats do migrate. Some bats will migrate really long distances and some bats will migrate um, short distances. Um, this is probably a shorter distance migrator. It's going to go to caves in the winter, hibernate, and then come back to its maternal area in the summer. And, uh, you know, these are the bats that you saw on the rivers, on the streams, on the lakes. They were skimming across the water. 
um, by the hundreds, um, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, they'll have one baby a year and they could live a really long time. They could live, uh, I think the record for this guy is like 37 years uh, in New Hampshire. So it's kind of cool. Small little mammal like that. Uh, here's another myotis bat. It's a northern long-eared bat. You're probably sitting there going, wow, what's the difference between this guy and the other guy? Um, they, they look similar, but they, they really um, occupy different areas of um, feeding. These guys really like to feed in the forest, so you don't necessarily find them kind of out in the uh, big open areas like you might find uh, a little brown. Um, now, they'll feed over water and things like that, but um, they, tend to, they tend to really stick to clutter and forest is what we know. This is a federally threatened species. Um, it was put on the list in 2015. Uh, as threatened, and uh, we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but um, again, it's another myotis bat. It migrates to a cave, sleeps for the winter, and comes back uh, in the summer. And the kind of cool thing about this that makes it a little different from the um, the, the little brown is, is um, the little brown will go to one roost and kind of stay there all summer, have their babies. These guys will go to tree roosts out in the woods and um, they'll move the roosts anywhere from every two to 14 days. And it's really just probably a way to get um, away from predators and, and not be noticed as much. And they tend to be in smaller colony sizes. Um, whereas, you know, little browns, the house that I talked about in the beginning was basically packed with little browns and some big browns. Um, there were some northern longyards in there and some other bats, but it was 95% little browns. Um, the Indiana bat uh, is another myotis bat. Uh, we don't have it here to, in Maine, but um, Vermont, uh, in the Champlain Valley, New York has uh, a decent population of these bats. These are federally endangered bats. Um, they've been fairly well studied, um, you know, they, they, again, the reason why some of these bats are, um, are endangered is because of uh, things like DDT, pesticides, things like that, um, and, and some things I'll get into in a little bit here. But, um, and the one big thing is, is they're really slow reproduction, uh, right? So they have one baby a year, and that baby, probably has about a 50% chance of survival. So it, it's pretty low. The Eastern Pipistrel is another bat that we'll find here typically in, uh, in New England. You can see the reason why I kind of showed this picture was because of the pink forearms. That's how you'll know you have a Pipistrel. Uh, or sorry, I shouldn't, you know, actually now I should. It's a tricolored bat. It was changed. Uh, I should change that slide. I don't even know why. <laughs> it was changed quite a while ago too. But anyway, um, the tricolored bat is another small myotis bat, and it's another bat that we really don't know a lot about. Uh, it's a difficult bat to catch. It's really small. Um, we know that it, you know, we see it in the caves in the winter uh, when we do our counts. Um, and in the summer, it can be quite elusive. Um, the only place we tend to see it is uh, on acoustics. So I'll get into that a little bit. Here's our eastern small-footed bat. It's the most, it's the smallest bat in North America. Uh, it weighs about five to six grams, which is about five or six pennies. Uh, it's pretty small bat. Uh, it has a little robber's mask you could see maybe in that picture. Um, but again, this bat really likes to live in rocky talus slopes. Uh, again, it hibernates for the winter and only has one baby. Uh, again, we don't know a whole lot about these guys. We're learning a lot more uh, with a lot of these bats, but uh, that's a big brown bat. This is right now the most common bat in our area probably. Um, this is the bat that are really kind of, you know, when we get called, you know, are in people's barns, are in people's houses. They really like attics. They like to go behind people's shutters. They like to be in people's uh, awnings and things like that. Uh, they're very adaptable and have learned to live very well with humans. They could have multiple babies a year. Uh, 
uh, meaning they could have twins, triplets in some cases, but you know, typically they, they they'll have one, maybe you know, two bats. Um, and so it's a little bit faster reproduction. It's a bigger bat. This bat weighs about 17 grams. Um, compared to the other bats I was showing you, it was around, usually around anywhere from five to eight grams. Um, and this, this bat really likes to eat beetles and moths and things like that. Now we're getting into the migratory bats or, or what, we, what we call the tree bats as well. Uh, this is a silver-haired bat. And uh, this is pretty common in Maine. Uh, we don't ever really get to see it. They're hard to catch. Uh, it has a cool kind of silver fur on its back. If I turned it around in a different picture, you would just see kind of a, a dark chest. These are, these are the tree bats, and they can have two to three babies, um, you know, one to, one to three babies. They uh, roost in trees. Um, they never go to caves as far as really we never really see them in caves. Um, we don't really know their hibernation strategy, although we think that they kind of migrate south and maybe kind of just cling to the sides of trees and maybe in cavities for the winter. Um, there's other anecdotal evidence that these guys, the red bats, um, will roost in forest litter. Uh, and we know that from uh, when they'll have prescribed burns in the Carolinas or something like that, they, they have reports of bats coming up out of the leaf litter uh, when they're doing a prescribed burns in the winter. And um, so, you know, that it, it makes sense to me a little bit. I mean, look at that red bat, it kind of looks like a leaf, right? Um, so it'd be really well camouflaged down there. Uh, again, we don't know a whole lot about these bats. These bats that I'm talking about now, the red, the silver haired, and this guy, the hoary bat, when you hear about wind power problems with bats, they tend to be with these tree bats or the migratory bats. Um, not to say that the other bats don't have problems, um, but these bats really are taking it hard when it comes to some of the wind power um, stuff. And this, this last guy, he's the hoary bat. Uh, he's probably one of my favorites North American bats. He's, he's very kind of, he's, I am looking up at him on a tree. He's looking down at me. Um, and, uh, you know, he's got a beautiful little line mane there and that silver hair. He's a big bat. Um, you know, he's 30, 40 grams in that, in that ballpark. He's one of our bigger bats in North America. Uh, and, and again, they're with, all the other tree bats, you know, they got multiple babies. They move around in the summer and they're really hard to catch. Um, so we don't know a whole lot about these guys. So, you know, why, why do we monitor and study bats? Um, they're, well, bats are really important in insect control and agricultural, controlling agricultural pests. They're great really bio indicators we'll get into that in a little bit uh important like i said in the beginning uh, species worldwide for pollination and seed dispersal uh, for bio indicators being that they're long-lived species can help us um kind of figure out some of these persistent um chemicals or heavy metals that are in the environment and we could use kind of um, bats as sentinel species as we do with birds and other wildlife. Uh, and the other nice thing is they're, they're very site faithful. So um, they might leave and we don't know where they go, but probably the chance that they're gonna be back at that barn, that same bat is gonna be back at that barn year after year after year. How do we catch them? and, and um, monitor them. So, so we put these things, they're called mist nets. They're really fine nets that we put in their travel lanes uh, as they're traveling around the forest. Uh, or we could put these heart traps um, at cave entrances, mine entrances, places that we think that we might catch a lot of bats, hundreds or more. Uh, we don't want to deal with that in our nets. We injure them in the net, so a heart trap is nice. And then we use bat detectors um, to hear the bats, basically, is, is the best way to describe it. And we ID the bats just like we do with birds um, by, by 
well, we don't really listen to them. We look at we look at the sonograms, and I'll show you what that looks like here in a minute. Here's a setup of our mist nets in a river, uh, and it, it, the mist nets are kind of rolled up, but you could see those bags, they're just plastic bags that are rolled up, and you could kind of see the net array that we're using there. It's kind of very involved. It closes off the river, so as they're flying up or down the river. Um, you know, we'll open the nets at night and, you know, just cross our fingers that they're being lazy and they don't have to look at them or see them uh, and they fly into them. And um, we'll go and we'll, we'll pick them out and we'll do whatever we need to do and then return them back to the wild as soon as we can. Here's a harp trap. Let's see if the video works. Sorry about that, that was my technical glitch, but um, the harp trap is basically monofilament line strung from, you could see kind of the top rail up there to the bottom rail. You can see kind of the monofilament line and as the bat hits that, it kind of tumbles down into the bag at the bottom there. And those are all bats in the bag down there. And you can see one of them, there's a bat kind of flying into it and, and we just, you know, dig down in there and take the bats out and, and then again, do whatever we need to do and return them to the wild as soon as we can. We talked about echolocation. This is what echolocation or bat acoustics look like. Um, so the top right one, yeah, you can see the big difference between the um, little brown bat we have there. And, and, the, and the hoary bat call signature. The little brown bat is really steep. The hoary bat is a lot flatter. They're in different kind of uh, killer range of frequency. Um, we use a lot of different kind of diagnostic tools to determine what species we're looking at. Um, but this is kind of a real kind of basic look at what, uh, what we're looking at on our computer screens. And there are devices that you could put on your phone and then you could go out and you could, um, you, you know, yourself um, can basically plug this little thing into your phone and, and you can walk around and it will tell you that it thinks that that's the big brown bat that just flew by and it will make some clicks and things like that. Whoops. Threats to bats that we know of, um, wind power, um, onshore and offshore. Habitat loss is probably one of the biggest things for wildlife in general, uh, and emergent diseases. And uh, one of them that we're gonna talk about right now is, is white nose syndrome. White nose syndrome, um, there's a picture kind of a carnage, but on the right is uh, a picture of a bat that has white nose syndrome. Um, you see those fuzzy little noses up in the up in the caves, and um, that that is how it got its name, white nose syndrome. Um, and basically, it's a fungus we know now. And uh, Pseudomyces destructans uh, was not known to science until we found it here in bats. Um, you know, it was out there, but uh, instead of calling it Pseudomyces destructans, we just call it PD for short. Um, the, uh, so some of the symptoms of, of white nose syndrome were, uh, the, we saw it, like I showed you the, the picture of the bat and then, um, the arm scaling and you can see the fungus along their wing membranes and, and things like that, um, was one of the symptoms. One of the other symptoms was abnormal behavior and this is, this is kind of what brought it to people's attention at first is, is bats flying outside the hibernacula in January or February. Uh, or found in large numbers dead at the um, entrances or exits of the caves. Uh, and we found that um, their fat supplies were depleted and they were dehydrated. And you can imagine, you know, being in the, uh, the Northeast in, in the winter. Um, 
and, and you know, you're not going to find water and you're not going to find food if you're a bat and it's January and you're in Vermont. Um, so bats are starving to death. Uh, they're very, you know, underweight. They're leaving the hypernacular early, like I said, and, um, and, and it causes dehydration as well. These are the species that were affected. Uh, there are all the deep species of bats. The, the tree bats, as far as we know, um, weren't as affected. The big brown bat, for whatever reason, is not as affected. And all these bat species have different levels that they have been affected. Whereas, like, uh, the little brown bat, 95, 93% decline uh, in species. Uh, Northern long-eared bat, 97 to 99 percent to climate species uh, population. So some bats have really, really um, been affected by white nose, and some bats not so much. And as it spreads kind of across the country, um, again in the chronology here, um, it, it it's going to in, you know, it's going to affect a far more species of bats than we have here kind of east. There's about 50 species at, at any given time in the United, in North America um, for bats. So, uh, sorry, uh, it was first documented in uh, 2007 in four caves around Albany area. Uh, and, and it was probably actually in there in 2005 or 2006 now that we know more about the disease. Um, this is just a smattering of caves in 2007 that had mortalities, and you could see they're kind of the red ones right around Albany. Um, and then the smaller scale mortalities, which were on the edge of New York and into Vermont. This is the picture, fast forward from 2006 to 2019. It has spread all the way across the country uh, to the West Coast. It is in many Canadian provinces, um, and it really has done a lot of damage to our bat population across the across North America. What we know is that it was a fungus that was probably brought in from Europe, Asia. Not sure how it got introduced into those caves, um, and it took off like wildfire from there. And we have seen massive declines in bat numbers. Um, what I like to tell people is, so on a typical night before white notes, I would maybe be able to catch, I don't know, you know, maybe 30 to 50 bats, depending on the area we were in. Um, now, if I catch 50 bats in the summer, uh, sometimes that might be a good thing. Uh, it, it, in Maine, it, it's really hit our bats very hard. Uh, I was out 10 nights a couple of years ago uh, around different areas of Maine, and um, we didn't do well. Uh, I think we caught four bats in those 10 nights. Um, so it's really now it's just kind of hit or miss with pockets and what's left. And what might this mean, right? You know, I remember somebody asked me, you know, why do we need all these bats? Right? Well, the bats, think of the bats as the birds of the night, is, is what I tell people. It's, it's all those insects that birds eat during the day. Uh, well, those insects aren't out during the day. There are different insects out at night. And the bats feeding those insects uh, and can eat a lot of insects uh, when you add up the biomass of bats. Um, you know, so, it, what might this mean? It's always hard to tell. It's always hard to be predicting, but it could mean more insects. Um, how did how did white nose spread across the country? Well, we know that um, from our band returns uh, from this one study in Vermont, we have a uh, uh, banded bass in a cave in Vermont, and these are all the places that they were found um, leaving leaving those caves and, and you know, these are the places they were found in the summer. So um, you could see, you know, move out to the areas in the summer, obviously they're gonna have interactions with other bats, even though the, the 
um, fungus might not be on them at that point. Um, they spread and they and they move on. And, and and you know we obviously see that. The other thing that might have spread the the fungus in the beginning was was us as researchers. Uh, we we didn't we didn't um, think about decon decontamination procedures, things like that. And uh, unfortunately, we might have spread white nose um, to some of the caves in the beginning running around, not understanding what we were doing. Uh, how to, and then, and then, so <laughs> this is a picture of uh, Indiana bats hibernating uh, in the winter. And you can see how densely packed they are. That is probably about an uh, area of about maybe two foot by two foot, maybe three by three. Uh, very small area. You can see there's a lot of noses packed in there. So if one of those bats has something, good chance that all the other bats are going to get whatever that bat has. So also, uh, what does it do, right? What does it do to the bats? It damages their wings. It makes it difficult for them to fly. But like I said, uh, it, it, um, it, it, it's an irritant to them. So what happens is, is they wake up in the winter and bats only have so much reserve for uh, fats and water to get through the a normal winter. And, and, and arousal during the winter for hibernating bat is typical. Maybe, you know, we'd see on the order of five arousals and each time a bat is waking up, uh, it has to take its body temperature from the ambient temperature in the cave, which is in the 40s, and warm itself up to 100 degrees. And when it does that, it takes a lot of calories and a lot of energy and a lot of water. It could do that a certain amount of time. It has a fat reserve to do that. Uh, what happens is uh, with white nose is it irritates their skin and it makes that arousal happen, say, three to four times more than it would if it didn't have it. And that's what causes kind of some of the, uh, well, obviously the starvation and the, the lack of water. So what can we do? Um, you know, we can stay out of caves and mines in the winter, um, watch and follow cave closures. Um, Speleological Society has uh, very robust uh, um, decontamination procedures that uh, biologists follow when we go into survey caves. And the uh, big thing that we could do in the summer is protect the maternity colonies. Um, these bats that are coming to breed, put up bat houses for them. Uh, if you have bats in your house and you could wait to get them out, exclude them from your house, um, when the pups are not around, that would obviously be tremendous. Uh, now, there are times where that can't be done, and human health is a concern, and that's understandable. Uh, but everything that can be done to try to prevent that is um, a win for the bats. And really, uh, the big thing is, is offering um, a nice, warm place where your bats can go and um, peacefully have their babies in the, um, the, the summer. So... I'll get back to this and, and, and uh, the house of horrors, right? Or, or the fun house, I call it. Uh, there are all these bats in this house and all these other animals and the raccoons and possums and, and now the bats are all gone. And the bats being all gone, so are all the other animals. Raccoons are gone, the snakes are gone, everything's gone. And I think it's a good story that we have to see that, that we remove one tiny thing from the environment and it can have a huge ripple effect across everything that we, that we do. Really important as a conservation biologist to get that message out there that all these animals are important ecosystem-wise. And we need to look at things as an ecosystem approach and understand how they fit into each part of, of nature. And uh, I'll kind of leave you with that. Hopefully I didn't take too long. I'd like to thank you all for listening. Um, 
thank the library, the Canada Public Library, Coastal Mountains Land Trust, and there's some information down there. If you'd like to email me or uh, call or check out BRI's website, uh, I thank you all for taking the time to listen and learn more about bats. And um, I'm always happy to talk about bats. Uh, email oh, me. We do have some questions that came in, Dave. So I'll, I'll go ahead and ask you some questions if you don't mind sticking around for a, you know, a couple more minutes to answer. Um, so yeah. we, we did have a question about from a young listener. We had a, a young man who was six years old who um, asks, do coral snakes eat bats? Sorry. Um... What was it? Do, do coral snakes eat bats? Oh, coral coral snakes? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, the, they're sea snakes. Um, there are bats that roost in kind of sea caves and things like that, but I'm not too sure that a, a coral snake would, would be able to maybe get to some of those bats, but it's a possibility. Uh, you know, in wildlife, I tell people there are no absolutes. So uh, it's hard to rule something out. I would say that it's not their main prey, but it is a possibility. Thank you. Um, sure. Elizabeth, Elizabeth mentions that she uh, used to have hundreds of bats that exited her attic each night, and now she only gets about 45 max. So she's just pointing out that she's noticing the decline in the bat population right around her as well. Um, where can I put up two bat houses? Megan asks that. Where's a good spot to put up a bat house? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so what I tell people is, um, usually you want to get it about 12 feet or more off ground. And that way they don't have to worry about ground predators as much. Uh, they really want a warm, sunny place. Um, so, uh, a south facing, southeastern facing area on a tree is fine as long as it gets sun for most of the day. Um, it's fine. And, and what I tell people here in the Northeast is, is paint them black. Um, and that will give more kind of, uh, you know, the, the sun and thermal. Um, thermal heat. And, and the, the nice thing, uh, the other nice thing is, is maybe get a multi chambered bat house so that has different chambers in it so if it gets too hot they could move up or down in those areas thank you i'd never heard that about painting them black that's very helpful information um sure. spe speaking of the heat that they require or that they desire um one of our our audience members has asked are there bats found in the north pole or very far northern regions you know, that's a really interesting question. And, uh, you know, uh, when uh, I was uh, up doing some work in the Arctic uh, on uh, yellow, yellow bill loons, um, I kind of thought about that when I was out there looking around. And, and uh, so I, I dug around and, and um, you know, the, the, I think probably where the bats kind of end might be where the tree line ends. And, and why I say that is um, I, I look to the Inuit, the natives that occupy that land up there. And um, I was looking for, you know, uh, talking with some of them and then, and then uh, looking for a word that would, um, they don't have a word for bat. So that means they probably never seen a bat. Um, so, you know, in my estimation, that means there probably aren't, you know, there might be occasional flies up there, but for the most part, I, I don't think um, you see a lot up there. Now, there are bats in Alaska. We're learning a lot more about bats up in that area. Um, um, but right now, it's, uh, it's still in the learning phase more than anything else. Okay, thank you. Um, we had someone ask about showing their bat house, but I'm going to go ahead and recommend that they can can email you an image of it if they're concerned. Um, that's probably the best way to do that. Um, uh, Theo wanted you to share a little bit more about the, um, you mentioned an ID website, a website that people should take a look at if they're looking for identification of bats. Can you remind us what that was? 
Yeah, so um, a, a great resource, I think, is Bat Conservation International. If you Google BCI or BCI.org, Bat Conservation International. And um, they do a great job. They, they, they have a lot of resources out there about our North American bats, bats around the world, um, what you could do to help, um, all, that, all that stuff. They, they are a great resource out there. Okay. Uh, another great, uh, one other good resource would be uh, bat conservation and management. And um, they're more a place where you might be able to go and get um, some bat houses and some advice about exclusions or advice about um, where to put the bat houses and things like that. And, and BCI will have some of that as well. Thank you. And, and Rick just posted the, uh, that website. Um, so thank you for doing that. And then this will probably be our last question. Uh, Megan also asked, what can we do to stop the white nose disease? Is there any information that we have on how this would ever end? Right. That's a good question. And, and it's something we're working on as scientists, right? Um, it, 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 they are working on vaccines, they are working on uh, inoculations maybe, or sprays that can mitigate um, the fungus. It is a difficult question. How do you inoculate, you know, and we're going through that right now, right? How do you inoculate millions of animals? Um, and we're having a hard time doing it with humans that want to be vaccinated. <laughs> Messing with a bunch of animals that don't or don't know what you're trying to do to help them or whatever, um, it, it's it's a big task and 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 really to figure out kind of what what can be done. Um, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife has a great site. Um, if you type in Google U.S. Fish and Wildlife White Nose Syndrome, um, there's another great resource there that can tell you about kind of what's being done and what might what what can be done by the general public to help and they really are looking for um general public you know come and they give grants and things like that if you have an idea of a way to do this um that will work they will listen Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, this has been some really great information. And uh, to everyone out there, we apologize. We've had some technical difficulties with sound and stuff tonight, but a lot of folks hung in there and listened to your wonderful, wonderful um, bounty of information. Uh, I want to remind everyone that we do these on second Thursdays, these Coastal Mountains Land Trust talks. And you can find out more about them by visiting the Coastal Mountains Land Trust website or by visiting librarycamden.org. We have an events calendar up there and lots of information. Um, thank you again, David. This is extremely informative and we appreciate your time and sharing this important information. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you all.